And I uh, just want to thank everybody for, for coming. Um, we have uh, Hans here from Bright Sense who will be presenting about air source, sorry, air source, air to water heat pumps. And um, Mary Wiener with Holy Cross Energy as well. Um, and so we'll send out a follow up. Um, if anybody's unable to make it today, you can always access this recording at your leisure. And uh, I'll hand it off to Mary to go ahead and introduce Hans. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you spent Thursday, a little Thursday on a hot here in Glenwood Springs. And Hans, it's great. Hans and I met maybe a year or two ago, and you're sitting in Boulder, right? Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And so he started the company Bright Sense in 2013. And it really is providing solutions from what we call today electrification or fuel switching. So he was way ahead of his time. So that's the big word buzzword you're hearing these days is electrification. So that means switching from whether you're on propane or natural gas to electric heat. And that's what these heat pumps are. They are all electric. And he loves developing and he is very, you will see through his slides, very innovative with his me mechanical systems with this air to water heat pump. And he wants to make sure that all of us homeowners, he does mainly residential um, buildings, that we all ha live in a very comfortable and also very healthy environment in our homes since we, especially nowadays after the pandemic, we spend so much more time in our homes and it's important that we have a comfortable, healthy home. And he's gonna talk about the importance of that and everything. So Hans, welcome. Thank you so much for spending your Thursday with us. And we look forward to hearing from you. Very good. Thank you, Mary. Um, thanks for uh, allowing me to present. <clears throat> um, here we go. Um, yeah, my name is Hans Price. My company is Brightsense. Um, I work pretty much all over the uh, Rocky Mountain West, um, so not just uh, limited to the Front Range. I have clients um, all over, um, all over the country. Um, and um, yeah, today we're going to be talking about hydronic air source, low temperature heat pumps, also called cold climate heat pumps. Um, those are all very big words. So let me explain. Um, hydronic means that we're heating water. Um, air source uh, means it's um, a heat pump that um, taps into the out outside air. Um, yeah, not a geo geothermal heat pump that taps into the underground. This is an air source heat pump. Um, low temperature or low cold climate means it is suitable for our um, climate here in the Rocky Mountain West. And then, yeah, heat pump. Um, so it is a device that uses refrigeration technology um, to increase uh the temperature and uh yeah pump it from one location to another so it's usable for um what we are doing what we are intending it to do um yeah my my company I, i'm a, a building science consultant i have been um, helping homeowners um uh, architects builders developers uh, build more efficient um uh, comfortable, healthy homes. Um, yeah, as as homes become more airtight, um, yeah, it's important to uh, bring in fresh air. The ventilation uh, system design is um, a, a good part of uh, my uh, business as well. Um, right sizing, yeah, boilers or furnaces have been uh, greatly oversized. Um, traditionally um, just to be on the safe side it's um it's better to um, have this eight cylinder in your basement instead of a, a small turbocharged four cylinder that at least years ago that was um what uh, people were doing but then yeah that led to short cycling and uh, temperature swings and so forth and high energy consumption um so now we are right sizing and um yeah, as you will see further down in the presentation, um, sometimes we might actually be down, undersizing. So we are um, putting in piece of equipment that's too small 
for the load, um, but that's perfectly fine, um, as you will see. Um, yeah, I have a passion for energy efficiency. I've always been a um, an energy nerd. Um, I remember as a little boy, I, I told my my dad, "Hey, that faucet is dripping. Uh, it needs to be fixed. That's waste." Um, so <laughs> started early. Um, yeah, and I see my mission um, to help people uh, get access to um, innovative uh, heat pump technology uh, to save the save the planet one home at a time. Um, homes are a complex system. Uh, yeah, there's the envelope. Um, then there are the occupants. Um, occupant behavior plays a big role. Um, same as you can drive a, a car um, so that you get a really good gas mileage, or you can floor the pedal and um, you can get a really poor gas mileage. So you can also run your house accordingly. You know, turn on the heat and open the windows at the same time. Um, it will drive your heating bills up. Um, then the appliances. Um, if you like to entertain, if you're using your double oven a lot, um, that all has a, an impact on uh, the performance of your home. So um, it's it's always a um, uh, yeah um, part of the conversation um, with a homeowner. Yeah, um, how do you live? Uh, what are you, what's important to you? Do you have any health issues, health concerns? We need to be aware of. So um, that all plays a big role when we design systems for people. <clears throat> hey, Hans. Hey, thank you. Diego didn't have his, he was, we were hearing some background noise from Diego, so he's muted. So thank you, Diego. All right, go ahead, Hans. Okay, yeah. So there are many uh, different types of um, space conditioning systems. Um, yeah, there's boilers. Um, a boiler heats water. Um, the furnace uh, furnace heats air. And then there are you know, wood stoves, pellet stoves. Um, the traditional um, electric resistance heat, electric baseboard is electric resistance heat, or those infrared overhead lamps that some people have in their bathrooms. That's also electric resistance heat. Um, and then there are heat pumps. And today we are going to be talking about heat pumps and um, what um, applications there are for heat pumps to replace some of those existing uh, traditional, um, in particular, the gas fired appliances. Now heat pumps have been around for a long time. Um, your refrigerator is a heat pump. It removes thermal energy from inside the cabinet. That's um, how we yeah, are why there, the temperature drops in, inside that cabinet. And it pumps it um, out the back. Um, and that's why the back of the fridge is, is warm. Um, yeah, then there are the um, uh, yeah, window air conditioners. A lot of people are familiar with. Um, in recent years, the heat pump hot water heaters um, have uh, gained quite some traction. I believe there was an earlier presentation about these uh, units. Um, they um, absorb thermal energy from the ambient, um, from the room, and dump it into the water to, to heat the water for showers. And so that, uh, yeah, that's a pretty brilliant um, way of generating um, hot water uh, highly efficiently. Um, yeah, then there are uh, the mini split heat pumps. Yeah, that pink box um, up there, that's um, a mini split um, uh, condenser. And then the, the other typical air conditioner, those cubes that you might be familiar with outside of people's homes. So heat pump technology has been around for a long time, um, but yeah, now um, I would like to call it the uh, yeah we are at the at the dawn of the new heat pump age. Um, it's um, a lot of money is being invested in heat pump technology because um, uh, yeah 
we need to get away from carbon uh, to um, uh, reduce our carbon emissions. Electrification is is the big buzzword, and um, so yeah, heat pumps are uh, the most efficient way of getting there, as we will see further down the presentation. Um, just briefly, the re refrigeration cycle. Yeah, we have an evaporator, um, and we have a condenser and a compressor and uh, the compressor pumps the refrigeration fluid around it evaporates um, on you know, in the evaporator obviously um, evaporation requires energy that's why um, there is a cooling effect that is um, being generated right there that cooling effect um, uh, can be used for cooling if if we wanted to um, but um, yeah, so that thermal energy that's absorbed is then pumped around the circuitry and um, it, when it reaches the condenser, um, it where it condenses the, and the, during the condensation process, the condensation energy um, is released, um, yeah, which is um, the uh, absorption energy that we picked up on the other end, uh, plus the operating uh, energy that the compressor added and um, so that's our usable heat if we are in heating mode. Um, this um, uh, process um, can be reversed. Um, yeah, so um, when you buy a heat pump today, you automatically uh, get uh, cooling for free. Um, yeah, all the, the heat pumps um, are reversible. Um, so um, you, you basically get the um, the chiller functionality at no charge. Um, there, I should say that there are some air conditioners out there which are technically also heat pumps, but they they are not reversible. So um, you want to make sure that um, what you're what you're buying, if you're buying a heat pump, that you are buying a, a true heat pump. Um, and we will be talking about that uh, later on. What what to look out for. Um, so uh, quickly on the heat pump efficiency, um, uh, yeah, where we are on the evaporator, where we are absorbing our thermal energy, um, then um, we are adding the operating um, energy that um, is required to, to run the piece of equipment. And then we have the usable um, thermal energy in heating. Um, so in this example, um, we are absorbing three units of energy. Um, we are adding one from the operating side, um, and we get four um, units of usable energy uh, delivered for our space heating. So in this case, four to one um, would be our coefficient of performance, 400% uh, or a COP of four. If we were to look at this um, from a cooling standpoint, our usable cooling um, energy is three units. And so three units versus one for operating the piece of equipment um, would be a 300% um, uh, efficiency or a COP of 3.0. Yeah. And in, yeah, in cooling, we don't care about the, the hot um, uh, thermal energy that we are rejecting. Um, Unless we, we were to use it to heat a heat a pool or something like that, but that's a completely different animal. <clears throat> yeah, so heat pumps, um, geothermal uh, heat pumps, those with an underground heat exchanger, those can achieve up to five hundred percent. Yeah, a COP of five. Air air source heat pumps, um, uh, not quite uh, uh, just yet, um, but uh, yeah, a COP of four. 400% uh, is, is still realistic um, during milder days. This is what a, a typical heat pump installation looks like, the heat pump itself um, loca located outside. Um, uh, so this is a, a large model, a five ton, um, that is uh, yeah, a total of um, uh, 60 inches tall, including the rack that we see here. This, uh, this rack is required in cold climate, um, because um, there, um, 
there is some effluent that um, is generated during defrost. Yeah, so sometimes when um, the um, heat exchanger itself, where the thermal energy is absorbed, when that drops below the dew point, um, some frost will, will build up. Um, and um, when the heat pump detects that frost, um, yeah, the, the, the frost uh, hampers the um, heat transfer. Um, and so when the heat pump detects that, um, uh, to a certain extent, it, it will then uh, go into defrost mode and melt um, that um, uh, layer. And that uh, yeah, results in some melt water that will then collect underneath. Yeah, if it's significantly below freezing, it, it will refreeze and form an ice sculpture underneath. Uh, and so this rack gives us some clearance that does um, uh, does not uh, cause any any trouble for the, the heat pump. But it's important that the heat pump is not um, uh, located anywhere near a walkway or driveway where where this uh, this ice uh, could uh, cause any trouble, um, yeah, hazard or um, any any other issues. Um, the um, the rack also um, prevents the the heat pump from getting buried in a snowdrift. Yeah, if we have a really snowy climate and um so um but it's um yeah we have uh, yeah, many heat pumps um in operation in yeah in steamboat and in aspen and breckenridge in uh, crested butte uh, so it really snowy climates and um yeah there are uh, smart ways of um, making sure that um our piece of equipment is is working really well um Low temperature means um, we are able to operate down to negative 15 to negative 25 degrees. That depends a little um, on uh, humidity, wind, um, sunshine. Um, uh, that all plays a role. That's why there's not a, a really hard cutoff. Um, but um, yeah, the heat pump will try to operate as low as possible. Um, it's just at one point, um, at, yeah, when it's really bitter cold, um, yeah, there's there's not much that the heat pump can absorb from this frigid outside air, and and so at that point, yeah, there's um, it's we're basically approaching a, a coefficient of performance of one, and um, so at that point, the other electric resistance backup heat. Is, um, is is the same efficiency and um, so it, it doesn't make sense to continue operating the heat pump at that point. Um, we can produce up to 125 degrees Fahrenheit uh, water in, in heating mode um, and that makes the heat pump a really really good tool um, for uh, any type of radiant. Um, the, yeah, uh, yeah. Typical in slab radiant, either uh, yeah, you know, slab on grade, um, like a basement slab or slab slab on grade, an elevated slab, um, lightweight or regular concrete slab, um, and then products like warm board, uh, eco warm, um, also work extremely well. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have another slide on that um, coming up. Um, a staple up um, also works under certain circumstances in in really um, well insulated homes. Um, staple up works well. The, the problem with staple up is that the heat has to travel through the top floor from the bottom up, and and so that resistance of that added subfloor that um, reduces the output. And so you need a, a well insulated home um, if it's a leaky. Uh, log cabin, um, yeah, um, I would say, yeah, be extremely careful. That might not have enough output at that point. Um, also, uh, cast iron radiators, yeah, those old traditional um, beautiful cast iron radiators work really well with um, heat pumps. Um, or yeah, some uh, folks like uh, European style uh, panel radiators, those flat panels that are typically mounted underneath a window, works also perfectly well um, uh, with a heat pump. Um, 
uh, hot water base board is something that we cannot work with at this point. Um, hot water base board requires a high water temperature, 160, 180 degrees. That is because those are basically convectors um, and convection requires higher water temperature. But um, yeah, for, for those um, people who have hot water base board, yeah, those were installed typically in the 80s and 90s, um, yeah, when uh, construction quality was not really um, super um, yeah, well insulated. Homes um, were still up and coming at that point. And so um, if, if you have hot water baseboard, you may want to look into having an energy audit done and, and really um, um, checking yeah how can how can you improve the energy efficiency of your home um, to start windows air tightness and those uh, those kind of things um, before you look into upgrading your your heating system um, but um, yeah in, in, in a few years there might be heat pumps that can produce hot water um, warm enough but then on the other hand the hot water baseboard is also not very comfortable the hot air, rises to the ceiling yeah, there's this typical description you have a hot head and cold feet with with a hot water baseboard so it um yeah maybe the house um is a good candidate for a, a deep energy retrofit and then also we yeah, add add the radiant at the same time um here, um, a few examples for Radiant. Um, so here, the big picture is um, in-slab Radiant. So this is on the upper level. Um, yeah, the, the Radiant pipes uh, stapled to the subfloor. Um, Six-inch six spacing uh, we are seeing here. Um, yeah, this is just before the um, the lightweight concrete slab is being poured, and um, and then yeah, they had um, hardwood um, uh, floor installed above that. Um, warm board or eco warm, those are sub, basically subfloor panels um, with grooves um, already. Um, installed that um, and, and an aluminum heat transfer plate um, to spread out the heat between the pipes. Um, those are also really good products um, for uh, in-floor radiant with heat pumps. So they work really well. Um, uh, bottom left is a picture of staple up looking at the floor joists um, up above um, with uh, aluminum heat transfer plates. Um, so the, the radiant piping um, that snaps into those uh, aluminum heat transfer plates. The aluminum spreads out the heat a little uh, further beyond the piping. Um, so it's not a true staple up anymore. Yeah, the, They used to be stapled, uh, truly stapled to the subfloor. That's not done anymore. Those, those heat transfer plates that are screwed onto the um, subfloor, that's um, what's being used today um, to increase the output uh, a, a level. And it also reduces or it, it eliminates noise. Um, the, the pipes, when they expanded and contracted uh, with the staples, they used to make popping noises, which were, was really annoying. Um, but that's um, a thing of the past with um, those heat transfer plates. Um, Just briefly on cooling, um, I get the question um, quite a bit. Um, even yeah, folks in the in mountain towns, um, what if we have really bad air quality? We are we we used to open our windows, be able to open our windows and let fresh air in, uh, light flush, um, yeah, reliably. Temperatures drop down into the fifties overnight. Um, but when uh, we've got wildfires, um, yeah, poor air quality, we don't want to want to open our windows. So um, people are considering to adding uh, to add cooling. Um, the the simplest way of of adding cooling uh, with a hydronic heat pump are um, uh, ductless fan coils. So these are yeah mini split looking um, units, uh, high wall uh, units. Um, 
uh, yeah, there's one showing here in this um, picture. It, it almost blends in. You don't really uh, see it. Um, yeah, they have, I admit they are not the, the prettiest, um, most aesthetic um, uh, pieces of equipment, but uh, they're really functional. They're, uh, there's no draft, there's no noise, um, and um, they're really effective and, and, and fast to respond. Um, there's also these um, consoles um, yeah, that can be mounted, a wall, wall mounted uh, floor standing, or they can even be uh, mounted horizontally on the ceiling. Um, I've seen them, um, uh, one builder um, in, install it above a closet, it, yeah, build a little um, a space uh, opening above a closet where, where the unit was hidden. Um, so um, those work e equally well. Um, yeah, those um, uh, typically, yeah, in a, in a mountain town, when you need uh, cooling, it's 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 a few rooms normally. Um, the other south and west facing rooms, um, uh, yeah, has been my experience, um, um, and and so you can you can place these fan coils in those particular rooms for spot cooling, and, and they're really effective um, and and quiet. <clears throat> and 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 um, yeah, not too expensive. Um, they can also, uh, uh, yeah, to a certain extent, they can also be retrofit later. Um, another option for cooling are whole house air handlers, uh, unitary hydronic air handlers. Um, so this is basically similar to this fan coil. It has a heat exchanger and a, and a fan built in. Only that this um, unit here requires a um, whole house uh, ducted um, a ducted system that brings the um, the cool air um, uh, yeah, to the respective rooms. Um, so this is a lot more involved, um, and um, yeah, because this is a, a blower, a larger blower, yeah, two ton, three, four ton um, capacity. Um, it's uh, significantly um, significantly derated uh, because of altitude, the, the other thin air. Yeah, the higher you go up, the uh, thinner the air, and and yeah, when you're moving air um, in this um, uh, uh, scale, um, yeah, the, you you probably lose twenty percent of its capacity because of that altitude derating. That's why you don't see those too much um, at higher altitudes. But um, uh, yeah, those are typically used in larger homes. Um, yeah, with um, uh, yeah significant uh, cooling loads because of a lot of glazing um, that brings in the uh, um, the um, the solar heat gain. Um, yeah, so let's talk about um, some more. Uh, talk some more about uh, heat pump efficiencies. And um, yeah, is this really a good technology um, for cold climate? Um, here I have an example. Um, this chart shows the outdoor temperature at the bottom from negative twenty to to eighty degrees, um, and we have a. a uh, loads, uh, heating load um, in BTUs here on the vertical scale. Um, the orange line here um, that goes from, from right to left, um, I realized that I have two orange lines in this chart. Um, so the, the um, orange line that goes from uh, right to left, um, this is the heating load of, of our home, of the sample home. Um, uh, it, um, I picked um, a load of 36,000 BTUs per hour peak at negative five degrees. So that's our red dot here, negative five degrees, 36,000 BTUs. Um, and um, so the warmer it is, the lower our heating load, um, yeah, and the colder, the, the greater. And then um, these three other lines here, those are the outputs of three uh, heat pump sizes. Um, yeah, nominal uh, 36, nominal 48, and nominal 60,000 BTU heat pump. Um, the 
I say nominal because those are at, measured at 47 degrees. That is um, an industry standard. 47 degrees is a measure measurement uh, for air source heat pumps, also mini splits. Um, the reason why these are lower than um, yeah the the 60 uh, is supposed to be at 60,000 at 47 degrees, but we are quite a bit lower than that. We are at um, what is that, 53,000 here. And that's again, because of our altitude D rating. Um, yeah, the heat pump absorbs thermal energy from the thinner air outside. Um, and um, so that's why we have, uh, we, are not, we are not getting quite the full output here at, at altitude. These, these are measured at, the nominal output is measured at sea level. Um, so when we compare these um, heat pump outputs with our the heating load of our, our home, uh, where those um, curves meet, um, yeah, with the small one uh, at plus 18 degrees, the medium size at plus five degrees, and the large one at uh, zero degrees, those are our so-called so balance points. Um, so the, that means that the heat pump is capable, has enough capacity to heat this home down to this temperature um, on its own. Um, and when it gets colder than that, um, we do need some supplemental heat. Um, so um, yeah, let's, um, with this example, let's move forward with the large heat pump. That's uh, yeah, the best match um, from my experience. That's what I would recommend. Um, the the uh, 48, the medium size is still um, uh, yeah, quite, uh, uh, has good performance for what we are uh, trying to achieve here. But let's move forward with the, um, with the large uh, in this example. And I should, uh, I should mention, you know, this is uh, typical, people might ask, you know, so what is, what is the heating load of 36,000 BTUs is negative five? What kind of a home is that? Um, so it, it would roughly be a 3,000 square foot home um, if it was a new construction today, or yeah, if it's a 20 year old home, um, roughly a 2,000 square foot home um, would, would have about this load at, at our uh, climate, um, in our climate zone. So um, just deleted those um, two um, other curves and, and uh, moving forward, um, some more illustration of what this means about um, yeah, the other in terms of efficiency. Um, so here we have our balance point again at uh, zero degrees. Um, yeah, that's how far down uh, the temperature scale uh, this heat pump would be able to heat this home on its own. And so this uh, beige area here that represents the energy that that uh, heat pump would be able to deliver. Um, when it gets below the balance point, the heat pump would still be able to deliver the, what's um, uh, shown in blue here, but um, we need some supplemental heat from um, yeah, this, this green, um, that's our supplemental heat um, that we need to um, source uh, elsewhere. And we'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, and then yeah, here, um, I was assuming that the heat pump would operate down to negative 18. So at negative 18, um, yeah, if it gets colder than that, um, we would need to have a heat source that can um, produce 100% of the load of, of our home in this case, in this example. Um, so the, yeah, this is all, um, it's a little simplified. Um, yeah, in, in reality, this is not a straight line because it depends on many other parameters. Um, it depends on, yes, the heat pump located against the south facing wall, that's a little warmer. Um, all these kind of things play a little bit of a, a factor too, but yeah, so for this example, this is where, um, um, what we're moving forward with. Um, now let's take a look at the climate, our local climate. Um, this is uh, a chart uh, that was recorded over 10 years um, at Aspen Pitkin uh, Airport. It shows the number of hours at certain temperatures throughout the year. So all of these added up together are the 8,760 hours um, that we have in a year. Um, but it shows that yeah, most of our hours here in, are relatively mild, you know, 20, 15 degrees and 
between 15 degrees and 65 degrees. So that's the majority of yeah, really 80% um, of our hours in a year are relatively mild. Um, we have a few hours below zero um, and we have a few hours yeah, where um, it, um, it, it, yeah, we might need cooling. Um, and, and then we have we are quite a few hours that are really nice um, where we don't need heating or cooling. Um, uh, yeah, really nice ambient temperatures. So um, looking at this, there's there's a very few number of hours down here, yeah, below the negative 15, um, just a handful. Um, so I would argue that um, yeah, the heat pump with uh, um, yeah, the performance that we were uh, discussing earlier, that that is a perfect match for this type of climate um, because um, yeah, it, um, the majority of the time it, it would really um, work extremely well at, at really nice um, COPs. Um, if we yeah, compa compare this, um, uh, yeah, in this computer animation, um, uh, the, these two uh, pieces of information together, um, the computers uh, spit out um, that we would need about 72 hours of supplemental heat in, in a typical heating season. Um, yeah, so this is that, this area here uh, that's green and blue. Um, that's yeah. These these few hours down here at the bottom, um, at the low end, 72 hours of supplemental heat, um, and um, we would need about two hours of 100% backup heat. So this yellow, in a typical year, um, yeah, two hours that that's nothing. Um, it's uh, yeah, and and those those bitter cold hours they typically happen early in the morning, just before the sun comes up, and so if you have a well insulated home. Um, you would be coasting right through those those two hours, um, um, and you wouldn't even notice it. So um, that's why um, I, I said earlier, yeah, it's it's perfectly safe to actually undersize a heat pump for uh, a, um, a heating system, um, because yeah, undersizing means we can save the homeowner money up front. Um, and um, yeah, the impact is is really low, is is really really small. Um, the heat pump, yeah, this energy here that the heat pump, the the beige and the blue together, that is ninety nine percent of the heating energy that is delivered to the home, um, and only, yeah, less than one percent is supplement is supplemental heat um, that um, we need to come up with uh, some other way. And so this, when I plug in the uh, coefficient of performance based on this weather, um, it gives me a COP of 3.2. That means for every kilowatt hour that we pay for, we get 3.2 kilowatt hours of usable thermal energy delivered to our house, 320% uh, efficiency. Um, yeah, um, some more numbers. This um, particular example had 130 million BTUs um, delivered to the home. Um, the heat pump would generate would uh, consume 12,000 kilowatt hours um, uh, to generate these 130 million BTUs. Um, 420 would have to be uh, supplied by the supplemental and backup uh, heater um, for a total um, heating bill of roughly $1,500 at uh, yeah, per heating season. And if you wanted to generate this. Um, electricity, those 12,000 kilowatt hours for the space heating only. Um, yeah, so not uh, your daily living, not charging an electric car, and not char and not um, no domestic hot water heating. Just the space heating alone, you would need a seven an 11 kW PV system to achieve uh, annualized net zero for this in this particular example. Now we're getting to some um, plumbing. Um, this is what a typical um, hydronic heat pump system would look like. Uh, so very simple, uh, straightforward, uh, your radiant heating system with the zone valves, uh, your thermostats, your zone panel. Um, and um, yeah, here's our heat pump. Uh, heat pump loads uh, the buffer tank with hot water. 
Um, the, the buffer tank has uh, two purposes. One is um, yeah, during those five minutes when the heat pump is in defrost, we would be feeding off of the buffer tank. So there would be no delay or no interruption to space heating, but it's also a hydraulic separator. Um, yeah, the boiler folks among you, they, they will know what a hydraulic separator is. The heat pump wants to see a constant flow rate here. Um, where on our radiant side, we could have one radiant zone calling or five or seven. Um, so the flow rate on the radiant side can, can vary greatly. And that's why we want to have this separation between those two so they don't affect each other. Here I'm showing an electric backup boiler. Um, yeah, that's right here on the system side um, for our supplemental and backup heat. Uh, these electric backup boilers, yeah, for a thousand dollars, you can get um, a, a really powerful, um, reliable, um, uh, hundred percent efficient uh, backup heater that um, is. Um, um, a very simple cost effective um, uh, yeah, appliance um, to, to provide yeah, those, um, those BTUs when the heat pump is, is, is struggling. <clears throat> if we wanted to do cooling, so we, we could certainly do radiant cooling also. Yeah, radiant cooling is, um, is a new buzzword um, that can certainly be um, implemented with, um, with the heat pump. Um, there are a few things to keep in mind. Um, it really it requires a new construction um, because um, it, um, it requires uh, certain things to be implemented. Yeah, you need to have a radiant cooling controller um, with a dew point sensor. You, you don't want to have any condensation anywhere, not on any piping in the walls um, or floors. Those all need to be insulated, um, and you certainly don't want to have any condensation on on any floor surfaces. Um, that the yeah, condensation in a home is is bad. Um, it can lead over time to structural damage, but it can also lead to mold mold growth and and health issues. So we need to make absolutely sure that um, we don't ever have any condensation. And so that makes the, the radiant cooling a, a really um, a difficult or if not impossible thing to retrofit. Um, uh, but in new construction, it can certainly be done. Um, um, the thing is, it's, it's also slow. The yeah, other bringing that uh, temperature of your, your floor down um, uh, in temperature is it takes time. And so um, people do it here on the front range and it works really well when we have 100 degrees and we can run the radiant cooling for, for weeks on end. But in, in a mountain town, um, yeah, if you only need a bit, little bit of cooling for two hours, maybe in the late afternoon, um, yeah, my recommendation would be a fan coil, point source uh, fan coil in those particular rooms that tend to overheat. Um, when you can't open the windows at night. Um, and uh, this is what that would look like. Um, the fan coils um, uh, yeah, on a separate um, uh, uh, circuit over here, but um, uh, connected to the same buffer tank. Uh, and so what we would have here is a seasonal switch over. The other homeowner um, would have a switch, a winter switch, um, and it would, uh, they would switch that to summer, um, and then we would be uh, cooling. Uh, in winter, we would be heating, obviously. And um, the, other, the advantage of this manual switchover is that you don't uh, cool down a hot tank and you don't uh, heat up a cold tank. Um, yeah, we have these huge temperature swings here between day and night, sometimes 40 degrees in the morning and 75 in the afternoon. If you wanted to automate that, um, yeah, based on the outdoor temperature, um, you would you would get um, a hot tank uh, cool down and a, a cool tank heated up uh, frequently, which which wastes um, the yeah, unnecessary energy. Um, that's why I'm recommending this manual switch um, um, that um, can certainly also be remote. Uh, um, remotely access, it doesn't have to be a manual switch. 
Hey, Hans, I yep. just want to give a time check. It's already 548 and we want to give time because we do have some questions. So do you, how many more slides do you have? Um, I have uh, 10 more slides, but I can I can certainly speed this up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. let's yeah, we're going to have to. OK, thanks. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, so this is yeah. previous uh, systems were very, um, very simple. This is more complicated. Um, this is for a home that has almost simultaneous heating and cooling. Yeah, if you have a home with um, um, that might still need heating on the north side, but um, uh, also cooling on the on the south side. Um, so yeah, typically larger homes. Um, this can also be done, but then yeah, we would um, be having a, a hot tank and, and a cold tank, um, and so that can also be done. Um, I also get the question a lot. Um, can I heat my domestic hot water with this heat pump? And the answer is yes, you can, but it makes the system a lot more complicated. Um, you need a tank with a coil, a domestic hot water coil. Um, and if you wanted to do cooling, then you would definitely need a cooling tank yeah, because we, we want to heat this tank all the time. We can't cool it, otherwise it would cool our domestic hot water. Um, so it adds, a significant complexity and it adds cost. These tanks with the coils are expensive. Um, they're they are not cost effective at this point. Um, so my recommendation is always get a hybrid heat pump hot water heater for your domestic with your um, heat pump, base heating heat pump. Um, these are much more cost effective. We, yeah, we cannot compete with this um, with a, a preheat tank that does not um might make financial sense at this point um if you needed um a larger if you you have a, a larger heating load you can certainly cascade heat pumps yeah these would be changed uh, they would be um staged um based on the demand you know on a milder day only one heat pump would run and and only on the colder day um both of them but otherwise the system is identical um and um, yeah, if I had one system with three heat pumps, um, that certainly can also be done. Joe, you know, this is um, um, uh, certainly an option. Um, just briefly on operating cost, um, natural gas uh, got um, pretty expensive last winter. Um, and if we do a cost comparison, um, the um, he, our heat pump um, at a COP of 3.2 from our example before, um, you can expect to pay about half of what you would be uh, paying with a 90% efficient natural gas fired furnace or boiler. Um, so yeah, your operating cost um, roughly half of um, what you would see with a natural gas. Um, same with propane, about the same, um, yeah, about half the cost um, with a heat pump. Um, if you had your own local PV system and generated your um, electricity yourself at a, a lower cost than um, drawing it from the grid, your operating cost would be even lower than that. Um, quickly on the carbon emissions, um, the other Colorado average in 2019, um, uh, yeah, it was 1.3 pounds of carbon per kilowatt hour electric versus natural gas, 0.4 pounds, propane, 0.5 pounds. So again, um, yeah, our 300% um, uh, uh, efficient heat pump or a COP of three would give us an advantage um, on the carbon emissions. Um, Holy Cross is significantly better, I learned. Um, uh, today, uh, so has has significantly lower carbon emissions per kilowatt hour electric. Um, so you're already, as a Holy Cross uh, customer, you're already uh, in better shape uh, than the rest of Colorado. Um, and again, yeah, if you have your own solar PV system um, generating your own renewable energy, um, obviously your emissions would be even lower than that. Yeah, so winding down, um, heat pumps are um, an established technology. Uh, there's um, a lot of um, R&D uh, research and development money being invested in, in um, 
technology, higher efficiencies, uh, more climate friendly refrigerants. Um, uh, yeah, um, you can imagine in, in Europe, a lot of um, uh, money is being invested into heat pump technology. They are, they're all worried that uh, the, uh, Putin would uh, turn off the gas. Um, and so they are scrambling to um, retrofit uh, heat pumps um, in you know, people's homes. Um, and um, we will certainly in North America, we will um, uh, take advantage of that, those developments as well. Um, yeah, all the European big um, heat pump uh, appliance manufacturers are present in, in North America. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the heat pump age is, is we're just at the beginning. Um, we will see a lot of uh, developments um, in, in the near future. Um, and um, yeah, heat pumps are low maintenance. Um, there's really not much uh, that needs to be done. Um, they're they're um, relatively low tech. Um, and uh, yeah, they're um, what's required for all electric homes. Um, yeah, requ um, required for um, achieving net zero energy. Um, or if you are looking to achieve a carbon neutral home, um, it would be very difficult to do it without a heat pump. Um, it would cost you a lot more money. You would need um, a PV system that's three times the size if, if you were to go um, um, without a heat pump. Um, and you would not be uh, getting any cooling. Yeah, so that's basically that's uh, my presentation. I'm, um, I think I'm going to hand it back to to Mary and uh, Diego and opening up for uh, questions. Thank you so much. <clears throat> there is Hans information and I know some of you want his, um, especially those living in Crested Butte, <laughs> which gets really cold. Gunnison. So there's Hans contact information. We will be sharing the recording and the slides. And then Hans, is there one more slide that shows the incentives from, yes. So we won't necessarily go all over all this. We'll leave this up as we start um, the questions as, as some of them luckily you already answered. So Diego, do you wanna start answering the questions? Sure. Let me see. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll start with the top. Um, Someone said, I have a natural gas radiant heat in central air and would like to add a heat pump to form a hybrid system to cut down on natural gas and replace my central air. Um, I guess they were answering that as to why they were attending at first, mm -hmm. um, but definitely can talk to a contractor about creating a hybrid system like that. Yeah, so if you have a forced air system, a, a furnace, a air conditioner, um, uh, you would not be looking at a hydronic heat pump. Um, you you want to look at uh, Mitsubishi, for instance. Mitsubishi has uh, ducted um, uh, uh, heat pumps. Yeah, this is a special version of the mini split. It, it's still a split unit, but it's not a mini anymore. It's a it's a maxi split, if you want to, um, if you want to call it that. Um, so that that, uh, that would be um, a manufacturer to look. Um, look at uh, Bosch uh, also has um, uh, ducted systems um, and, and others. Just make sure that you get a low temperature version um, that is capable of um, operating down to uh, the other into the, the negative temperatures. I know that Mitsubishi with their hyperheat technology, they can go down to negative 25. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Justin asks, how are you derating for altitude for the air to water systems? <clears throat> yeah, so the um, the outdoor heat pump um, that taps into the ambient air that is affected by um, the thinner air. Um, and um, I'm, I'm calculating with roughly a 7% derate at um, uh, up to 8,000 feet, and then I'm going up to 8 and 9% D rate, uh, up to 10,000 feet. Um, um, so that's, uh, if you look at the nominal output of, of uh, um, 
hydronic heat pump, uh, you would reduce that normal output by those percentages, depending on your elevation. Um, the water side, yeah, we're um, sending the, the radiant, um, the, the hot, uh, chilled water um, through our system. That is obviously a pressurized, and so that is not affected by um, our altitude to D rating at all. And so it's only the outdoor unit that um, uh, is derated. Perfect. Hans, I'm going to ask you to go to the next slide as well so people can see that. And then I wanted to ask a clarifying question somebody had. Was the example 3,000 square foot home a code level home? Um, so the uh, when I, yeah, I said um, 3,000 3, square foot um, uh, for a new construction, um, <clears throat> I would say that was a code plus home. Um, yeah, so um, the the uh, a code built home. Yeah, that's um, to say it bluntly. That's the worst home energetically that you are legally allowed to build. Um, yeah, so um, it it certainly is. Um, yeah, I call it code minimum. Um, I always encourage people if it's in their budget, um, put as much money into your envelope. Um, because yeah, that's the insulation's in there for good, um, yeah, for the life of the home, and it will keep you comfortable and keep your energy bills low for the life of the home. Um, yeah, yeah. And right. then this right. is a good question, actually, from Chris Lammers, who actually has an all-electric new home that's beautiful that I've been in. He's asking about the lifespan of the air-to-water heat pump. He's heard it's less than the air source heat pumps with forced air. So what is the lifespan of an Arctic heat pump? Um, so I've been been selling these um, yeah, or, or uh, specifying them for over three years, and I have not had a single failure. Um, um yeah I, I i don't know it that's that's my honest answer um i would expect because yeah because we are we are not really stressing the equipment yeah we are not asking it to produce uh super high temperatures um and so i would expect to that you would get at least 10 years out of um of life out of a unit um I, I would also expect, based on what I said before, yeah, a lot of um, money being invested in efficiency and, and more um, uh, environmentally friendly um, refrigerants that after 10 years, yeah, you might be able to get a heat pump that's twice as than what we have today. Um, so it might in, te uh, in 10 years, it might make sense to upgrade. Uh, is what I'm saying. Just like some people, you know, they replace their cars after so, so many miles. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think we've already answered some of other Chris's questions about the condensation and all that, which you did a really good job in that. Um, there's a question about a single, <laughs> single family homes. Uh, uh, sorry, are not as sustainable. Their construction and use release greenhouse gas emissions for the life of the structure. Heat pumps mitigate some greenhouse gas emissions, but not all. And this is kind of a, do you agree that they should not be allowed? So it sounds like the question is, should we start building more, I guess, multifamily units instead of single family homes? Or I think you answered that too. It's if you build it tight and ventilate it right, it's a healthy single family home, right? It, yeah, it certainly is, but um, and 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 this is a completely different discussion. Yeah, I, right. um, multifamily is certainly um, better for the planet. That's uh, I think that's uh, that's understood. Um, but yeah, that's not something that we want to uh, attack right. here today. <laughs> right. That's that's certainly, no. certainly true. Um, and uh, yeah, a heat pump it it does not it it does not have carbon capture. Technology uh, mm -hmm. uh, capability, so it's not um, it's not uh, reducing the carbon content of of our atmosphere. Unfortunately, that that would be really mm -hmm. phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there is a question that I'll answer because it's directed to Holy Cross. Is so, and as we hear electrification and like, whether it's electric transportation or our homes, can the electric grid handle it? Holy Cross does have the capacity. 
to handle it, but it's also going to be controllable and a flexible grid. So that's why the peak time payback. So our peak is 4 to 9 p.m. So the less we can use during that time, the healthier our grid would be. And that's how we keep our members rates reasonable. So we all work together as a membership to try to uh, reduce our usage during our peak loads. And then that gives us the flexibility to really um, provide a very healthy grid. So Yep, we've got the capacity and we're looking forward to electrifying more homes and transportation. All right. And Hans, I think you answered this question earlier too in the presentation, but is this type of heat pump capable of high enough temperatures for hot water baseboard heating? Uh, we know the answer is no. Uh, if you want to elaborate that on, uh, on that again, you're welcome to. Yep. I, I think we, we talked about that. It's, yeah, it, at this point it's not, and, and I don't see any heat pumps that are capable of producing this hot uh, water temperature uh, anywhere on the horizon at this point. And so what we do, because I have a hydronic baseboard system in my townhome, and your option is doing the mini split. So the, the ductless mini split system and keeping your boiler as your supplemental back, backup heat. Exactly. I mean, what you could do is if you're, yeah, if you're, your house was built in the 80s and 90s and you have the original boiler, it's, that is probably at the end of its life. Um, yeah, it's, uh, face it, it could fail any moment. <laughs> and so what you could do is replace it with an electric boiler, yeah, to go, yeah, to go 100% electric. Uh, and you use that um, for your uh, peak load, and you use mm -hmm. the mini splits for your base load, mm -hmm. um, and and for yeah to provide provide cooling if you need that. Um, mm -hmm. So that could be an option uh, to go all electric um, instead of replacing that boiler with another gas appliance. We have a series of questions here from Brian Sipes. Brian, thanks for attending. Um, so Hans, is an electrical service upgrade typically required for a larger home retrofit? Um, I'm gonna ask you a couple different questions. And then can these systems be retrofit to run existing snow melt systems? And the third one is are mechanical room space requirements similar to replaced equipment? Okay, um, so, um, uh, wait, uh, yeah, if you have a hundred amp service, um, you, you will uh, you, that will not be enough. Um, you will need at least two hundred amp service. Um, if if it's new construction, yeah, when I when I work on new construction projects, I always tell the builder um, um, that they need to supply four hundred amp uh, to the home. Um, so that the house is future ready for electric car charging as well. Yeah, one electric car charger is 40 amps. Um, um, yeah, most car most homes have two car garages nowadays, if not three. Um, so that yeah, heat pump plus um, all electric kitchen um, and uh, electric vehicles will definitely bump you above the 200 amp service that is that is most frequent. Um, so in new construction, it's a no brainer. Um, it, it does not add much cost. Uh, in in uh, retrofit, there are some um, there are some incentives that are available. Um, yeah, um, me in my home, yeah, I'm two thousand square foot home, um, uh, all electric. Um, we don't have an electric car at this point. Um, two hundred amp service is is perfectly fine for us. Um, but once we um, get an electric car, yeah, we will be getting close to that limit. So I'm, um, I, I will at that at that point need to um, uh, yeah, upgrade to probably 320 or 400 amps. Um, snow melt, um, snow melt requires a lot of horsepower. Um, yeah, the energy consumption itself during operation is not that great, but you need a lot of horsepower, and so. Um, a 60,000 BTU heat pump, yeah, the, the nominal 60,000 BTU heat pump, can only uh, supply snow melt to 300 square feet. Um, yeah, so that's a $10,000 heat pump um, to melt 300 square feet. Um, you can hire a lot of uh, uh, high school kids to, to shovel, I would argue, uh, for that money. Um, 
so it it's not um yeah and and i have designed uh, uh geothermal uh snow melt systems um you know they they're even completely off the chart in terms of cost um yeah, snow melts are a real challenge because of those horsepower that they require. Last question. Um, uh, yeah, we need a buffer tank. Um, typically, uh, yeah, with a single heat pump uh, or or two heat pumps, a uh, 55 gallon buffer tank. Um, that uh, requires a, a two by two square foot um, uh, you know, area of floor space. Um, so not a lot. Uh, yeah, when if you have a floor standing cast iron boiler that you're replacing, yeah, that tank slides right in in place of that. Um, in new construction, obviously, yeah, I'm I always ask for um, at least 75 square feet of uh, mechanical room for radiant. Radiant needs to go on the walls and stuff. Um, the heat pump or water heater needs some space. Um, ventilation system. So yeah. Um, so, um, trying to tuck it under the stairs, yeah, you know, that's very often is what um, what I'm being offered. Um, uh, thanks, but but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next question we already answered is what the supplemental heat would be in an electric home. So if you're doing the air to water, he talked about that electric kind of boiler system. Um, ductless heat pumps, a lot of people keep their electric baseboard heat in. And then with a ducted furnace, you can add a five kilowatt, which is 5,000 watt or 10 kilowatt electric resistant backup on that air handler. So those are kind mm -hmm. of most of your options, right? Exactly. Um, electric strip heater in an air handler um, yeah, can be done um, yeah, in the hydronic with radiant. I, I like those electric boilers. They are um, they don't have any moving parts. Um, yeah, closed loop systems. They're they're going to last forever. And um, if, yeah, me, some some people they still like to have a gas for a fireplace. Um, and so if you um, if you keep that gas line active, um, uh, or if you have um, a condensing boiler, the yeah, other that you just installed a few years ago, um, by all means, you can keep that as your backup. Yeah, if you if you don't mind um, uh, hanging on to that, um, by all means, that that ke uh, can very well be integrated. Um, and we already know it's it's the right size, yeah, because it's been heating your home. Um, uh, if um, if that's not the case, um, just uh, um, coming back to the the question about the heating load um, in new construction, we always do a manual J. It's it's required by code by most jurisdictions, but even if it's not, we still do a manual J. Um, which is the heating and cooling computer load, a uh, uh, load computer simulation, um, to be on the safe side. We we want to um, base our sizing on science. And um, in in existing homes, um, if you have uh, a couple of years of heating bills, we can extract the information from from your heating bills. You know how much you're consuming on the coldest during the coldest months of the year and and use that for size of the heat pump. Yeah, thanks. And I think that basically answered Mark's question about a 3000 square foot home with a, a 15 year old gas boiler and then wanting to have a backup and you could leave the gas boiler left in place and and control to provide the hot water only when you need really low, low temperatures, right? So the Arctic yes. would be your primary heat source. And just to make it very clear with the, our rebates, and I think same as you walking mountains, right? The heat pump needs to be your primary heating source. And Hans really pointed out, there's only a few hours, like what was it, 72 hours or something like that a year. There aren't many hours um, in the winter that you would actually, your heat pump would actually not work, at least mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing. Um, so yeah i mean we have some climates in colorado that are worse than that um mm -hmm. yeah there's um yeah certainly gunnison i mean gunnison yeah. is a really cold uh corner of the state um alamosa is also equally cold yeah. 
Um, so yeah, they can have 300, 400 hours um, that are, are yeah, um, around the limit of the heat pump. And so they, yeah, they are, we, we, we look at that um, um, slightly differently and make sure it still makes sense. Um, yeah. So Hans, could you tie in solar thermal heating into the buffer tank to increase efficiency? Um, short answer, yes. Um, the long answer yeah, might not make sense. So yeah, if you if you have an existing system, um, it can be integrated. Yes, um, uh, I would not. I would. I would. Um, argue that adding solar thermal uh, today does not really make sense if you don't have a pool. Yeah, the thing is with solar thermal, eighty percent of your output you will be getting during the summer summertime when you don't really need it. Um, so if you have a pool, you can dump all of that th th uh, thermal energy into the pool um, and and get a use out of it. Um, yeah, but in the winter time, you have the temperature penalty from the cold weather. The the, the days are short. Um, yeah, shorter sunshine. The sun is low in the sky. Your panels might be snow covered. All of that reduces your output greatly. So I would um, I would tell folks um, buy solar PV panels instead. Yeah, if you have additional. As if you have surplus energy, your your meter will spin backwards. You get credit. Um, you can use elsewhere. Um, um, where with solar thermal, your surplus energy is is lost. Um, yeah, the um, solar thermal does does not make sense uh, these days um, um, with the cost reduction of PV. Um, but if you have it and it's it's operational um we can integrate it yeah it's we, we have to be a little careful yeah, yeah your mechanical room might uh quickly look like a, a submarine uh, with piping and valves everywhere um and uh, you need a specialty controller that that um but um yeah it, it can be done it may not make sense yeah financially and if it right. if it requires too much uh changes too many changes Thanks, Hans. Um, and then a couple more questions. Uh, what's the expected lifespan of the various parts of a radiant system? And then the expected yearly maintenance on a radiant system. So the um, it, it used it used to be the the pumps, the circulators that um, that would break, um, and um, that was because those were all conventional PSC uh, motors. And they would, yeah, you know, because with radiant they run a lot. They run seven thousand hours a year, um, and so at one point they would burn up. Um, nowadays, um, yeah, it's all ECM circulators that are installed. These are DC variable speed. Um, they um, use a fraction of the energy that the traditional ones used to, and they. Um, they they have some electronics. Um, so if you um, you you want to have a um, a surge protector um, on your breaker panel to um, prevent yeah uh, power surges from um, killing your electronics. Um, but other than that, they should last a long time. Um, maintenance um, there you have to have some antifreeze in in your pipes in your radiant system um, because the heat pump sits outside and um, yeah when the heat pump is not operating during a power outage for instance you don't want those pipes to burst um, so there's a little bit of antifreeze in in that system and um, I would um, recommend uh, yeah, every three years or so checking that antifreeze, making sure it still has the frost protection that we're looking for. Um, but that's very simple to do. Um, other than that, there is really no maintenance, um, no cleaning. Yeah, I mean, you could right. uh, use a garden hose and, and hose down the heat exchanger if you have cottonwood nearby and, and the other seeds clog up your heat exchanger um yeah that and keeping snow away from it <laughs> yes yeah um yeah 
which is the yeah. big thing in in certain areas. So I, I what is one, I had uh, one heat pump that was um, they did not have any snow guards, and so the avalanche came down, buried the heat pump. <sighs> that was certainly yeah. Um, they got that fixed really fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What type of co coolant is used in the system? And I know that's changing. Yes, so right now it's all R410A. Um, yeah, Mitsubishi uses that, Arctic uses those, um, all of the competition that's out there. That's the standard right now. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, a lot of research money is, is being um, poured into development of different refrigerants. Um, but that, that takes some, takes some time and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it is coming. There are some more lower global warming potential refrigerants coming out. So, um, I think the, the goal is, um, CO2, um, but that is mm -hmm. really hard on gaskets and, and mm -hmm. other components internal. Um, so there is an interim, uh, refrigerant with a lower greenhouse gas, uh, warming potential. Um, but the, the, yeah, the danger is only when the refrigerant escapes and, and there is a refrigeration a recycling program in place. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, under normal circumstances, refrigerant should never escape. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Paula asked, um, I guess uh, we can it's answer for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, are the rebates good for new construction too? Um, Walking Mountains rebates are not good uh, for new construction. We only rebate existing construction, so retrofit projects. Um, and Holy Cross will rebate. I just just did one. So we do. If you're building all electric new homes or at least putting in a heat pump and that's your primary heat, we will and heat pump water heaters and induction stoves and induction dryers. So check out our website, check out Walking Mountains. Um, and also just to let you guys know, everybody's heard the Inflation Reduction Act passed. We are trying to get a handle on what that means. There is some money, actually a lot of money for efficient homes, um, some for income qualified folks. Um, so stay tuned. And then in 23, the Colorado also passed some, I believe, tax credits for heat pumps. So um, there's a lot of really good money being pumped into heat pump um, technology and um, getting those into your home. And um, Carl asked, uh, you recommended having an independent or separate domestic hot water tank system. How does electric domestic hot water compare to a gas domestic hot water from an operating cost perspective? Um, Carl, I will let you know, we did have uh, another webinar training uh, specifically about heat pump water heaters and they um, kind of dive into the specifics of operating costs and that, and uh, happy to uh, provide you the recording for that one as well if you want to check it out. Um, Hans, I don't know if you had anything to add. Um, yeah, so if you have an, um, an, an older gas uh, tank type, um, you know, 80% efficient, um, that is atmospheric conduct, conduct to come combustion, atmospheric combustion. Um, so you have a hole in, in your wall um, and uh, yeah, it, it can backdraft when uh, you run your bathroom fan or yeah, so you wanna get rid of this this uh, dinosaur. Yeah, those, those are not only inefficient, they are, um, they are um, dangerous. Um, as, um, yeah, as homes become more uh, airtight. Um, if you have a combi boiler or a tankless gas water heater, um, yeah, those are um, typically sealed combustion. Those are safe. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that the other ones are unsafe, but they can lead to unsafe conditions. Um, and um, yeah, those, those heat pump hot water heaters um, with the rebates that are available, yeah, they will pay back their their initial investment cost you know in in a year if not faster yeah and that's exactly what yeah what it said so yep and then one last i, I know hans you it, it is we have a lot of contractors that know how to do the air source heat pumps but the air to water is a little tricky so 
do you have any installers in the Eagle County? So that's where Vale de Dot Cerro or um, in the Roaring Fork Valley, do you know some contractors that know how to install the Arctic? Yes, um, we have um, a good dozen heat pumps um, installed in the yeah, Alinea territory. Um, so there are installers out there um, who have the experience. Um, I'd be happy to share them um, with you and uh, so you can spread uh, spread yeah. those names around. Sure, okay. Um, there, um, but it, yeah, I mean, we're, we're bringing on new contractors all the time and um, it's the, the heat pump, the Arctic um, hydronic heat pump uh, installation is very straightforward. Um, if you're an ex experienced plumber, an experienced boiler tech, if you've worked on ex equipment um, yeah, around space heating with radiant, you will have absolutely no trouble um, with um, installing this heat pump. Um, we are also available to offer yeah, tech support. Um, I'm I'm coming through um, yeah, yeah, every once in a while. I can do site visits, uh, training on the job um, it, yeah, is being offered. Um, and uh, yeah, but typically if, if someone um, uh, studies the manual, yeah, not um, um, uh, yeah, reading it front to back uh, like a novel, but um, <laughs> studying the key components, wiring, piping, and so forth. Um, it, it's very straightforward, um, and I'm happy to answer questions yeah, between the lines that are not being answered. <clears throat> and um, but it's yeah, the 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 problem installs are those where people don't read the manual, and and then. Um, you yeah, know, something, something goes wrong, doesn't work, um, creates an error and, um, yeah, trying to, trying to figure out what it is. Um, right. Perfect. Yep. So we'll get that out to everybody. Yep. Yeah. And then, um, Warner, we, um, also Walking Mountains and Holy Cross Energy both have a recommended contractor list as well that we will provide in our follow-up email along with the recording, um, and uh, slides and some rebate information as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I have a few heat pumps that were installed by homeowners who are really um, yeah handy. Um, um, happy to support those. Um, um, yeah, you you do want to have an electrician to do the electrical part, uh, at least at least the power side. Um, but um, you don't need any specialty tools. You, you, know, you don't touch the refrigeration side. It's all sealed uh, in a monoblock in the unit. Um, so it, it can certainly be done successfully by, by a DIY homeowner as well. That sounds great. great. Well, I think that's it for questions. Um, yep. Hans, thank you so much Met for your time today and for this presentation. Um, thank again, you everybody we, for attending. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, thanks everybody for, having for joining me. us. And uh, again, we will be following up with an email with the recording, the slides, um, rebate information, contractor lists, um, everything like that. So uh, be on the lookout for that from us uh, in the coming few days. And um, thanks everybody for coming. All right. Enjoy your evening. Thanks, Hans. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.